welcome to the Rick Fuller podcast presented by Rick Fuller, the team leader of the Rick Fuller team, which serves the San Francisco Bay Area and Sacramento County. Rick and his team have almost 1,000 five-star online reviews and have been honored as a distinguished small business by the California State Senate and Assembly. Rick is a community leader, national real estate coach, and real estate investing expert. I'm Christina Morales, a writer and marketing specialist, and today we're going to talk about how to find and purchase a flip. So with us, we have a very special guest, Damon Colby, who's also an avid fisherman like our Rick Fuller. So we'll try to stay on track today, you guys. (laughs) Damon is a Bay Area native from San Francisco and who currently lives in Pittsburgh. He's a real estate wholesaler who focuses on residential properties and land. He's also a virtual wholesale who works with agents throughout the Bay Area and out of state. His deals range from $250,000 to over a million, and he's always researching new ideas for marketing. So you sound like the perfect guest for us today, Damon. Welcome. (laughs) Thank you. So Rick, Tell us a little bit about Damon. How'd you meet him? And um, what do you hope our listeners um, get from today's podcast? Well, um, thank you, Christina. Damon and I were fishing just a couple of months ago, sturgeon fishing in the California Delta. Uh, We had a great trip. It was an epic trip. And uh, we got a chance to get to know each other better. And Damon told me about some of his investments that he was purchasing or considering purchasing. And anytime I hear somebody that's actually doing it, that it's not in theory, it's not a late night infomercial, I wanna have them on as a guest and I wanna talk to them because there's a lot of different ways to invest in real estate. Christina, you and I have put out tons of podcasts and resources and materials on ways that we've done it. And I always like to interview and find people that are actually out there with the boots to the ground and they're finding investment opportunities and Damon's one of those guys. And so Damon, welcome to the podcast. We're super excited to have you Thank here. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. And it was a great day sturgeon fishing, wasn't it? <laughs> it, was a, it was a great day. <laughs> an epic day sturgeon fishing in the, in the Delta. Yes, and so was. that's where we met and that's what prompted this. And that was several months ago. We just had to wait till we had an opening in our podcast. Uh, it works out perfect because it's the new year and people are looking at alternative ways to make money and and invest and the roller the roller coaster ride of the stock market has turned a lot of people's attention to the real estate market and the fact that home values have been rising significantly over the last several years uh, and have been on a continued bull run uh, means it's a great time to invest in real estate and so this will be a fun conversation today it will yeah so damon <clears throat> How did you get started in real estate investing and what is a real estate wholesaler? Well, you know, my, um, my friends, my family, they got me involved in the industry and I started reading about it and I kind of took it from there and ran with it and I started learning. I went to YouTube university for one (laughs) (laughs) and I, um, started taking courses. I started going to seminars. I also got mentors. So it, it, it's been working out pretty good for me, especially with a, with a mentor. You know, a mentor kind of just paves your way. You have someone to follow, and that's very important. You can't do this business by yourself. But as far as a wholesaler goes, a wholesaler is someone that just goes out, finds a piece of property, gets it under contract, and sells it to an end buyer. That's what a wholesaler, wholesaler is. Basically, in a nutshell, it's a person that gets a property at a discount and pass, and sells it over to someone else for profit. So do you have to be a real estate agent to be a real estate wholesaler? No, it doesn't require a license. Although, okay. although there are some states that may require, require a license because of some new rules and regulations. I think it's somewhere in Illinois though, but not okay. here. Basically, so how, we're, go ahead. So how does the process work between finding, buying, and selling the home? Finding, buying, and selling the home? Well, mm-hmm. First, it comes it comes into um, marketing. You have to market your you have to market for properties, or you have to have some great real estate agents like Rick that's going to bring them to you. <laughs> <laughs> but mostly, we do a lot of marketing, okay. a lot of phone phone calls. I have VAs that work for me, and it's just basically phone calls and, and sending out mailers mm-hmm. and signs all over the place. Just the basic 
the basic uh, marketing tools that a lot of people use. Mm -hmm. And that kind of works out pretty good for us. We get a lot of deals that way. Okay, great. You know, Christina, uh, I just want to touch on a couple of things that Damon has mentioned. Um, everyone that I know that's been successful in real estate investing, they all had a mentor. They but some of those mentors are local. Like they really, they meet with them on a regular basis, you know, face to face or today, Zoom to Zoom. Others are more distant. Uh, for me, one of my mentors was Gary Keller. He wrote the book, The Millionaire Real Estate Investor. Mm -hmm. uh, taught me a lot about real estate investing. He was one of my mentors that wasn't local, but I met with periodically. Uh, and then there were several others that helped me along my journey. You know, the statement and the idea that nobody succeeds alone is absolutely true. We really stand on the shoulder of giants when it comes to real estate investing. You really have to have a mentor. There's also some great mentors today that you can find online. Some exceptional books audio books, podcasts. I think about one of my favorite podcasts uh, that I've listened to for years, The Real Estate Guys. The grandfather, uh, the father, and the son. And when they want some really deep-rooted wisdom, they send the question over to grandpa, and grandpa answers the questions, and they invest all over. And so you've got all of these different resources, both uh, local and digital resources that are available today to help real estate investors. And what we do, Christina, I mean, we mm -hmm. built a group with the idea that investors can't do this alone, that they need help, they need support, they need guidance, they need tools and resources. Um, and we built the Investors Thrive Facebook group page so that we could drop videos like this into it and our tools and resources that we use when we find a property and identify it. And so you really have to have people that can help you along this way. When you start uh, joining, going down the direction of real estate investment, you got to have a team. And I'm not talking about your real estate agent team. That's important, but you got to have a team. You might have a contractor. You might have your preferred lender. You might have your hard money lender. Right. You've got to have a team. So you need your mentors and you need your team of people. And that's why Damon's at no competition to me. We work together as a team. We might have a property that doesn't make sense to go on the open market. That might be a better fit for him. And the, and the seller doesn't want to go through the process of fixing it and repairing it and all of those things. The other thing that Damon mentioned, I think that's really important, is you got to market. If you're going to market, you've got to have what I would call a missing property profile. It's like, what's that missing property that you're looking for? And a lot of people say, I'll, I'll take any good deal that comes my way. That's a huge you better identify what it is that you want, what it is that you're looking for. So when it shows up, you recognize it. And when you do that, you help avoid mistakes. If you're learning for the first time on every investment property you purchase, it's a new, new home, new market, new industry, it's a different type of property, it's a different type of contracts in a different area. If you're learning on every investment, you're gonna make a lot of mistakes. But when it becomes consistent, and you do the same thing over and over and over again, you get good at it. You get the tools and resources. And there's a synergy, an economic synergy that occurs that you have a tool, a resource, a contact that can help you through all of those properties, not just the one. And you don't have to go find something new for every investment opportunity. So I think both of those are really critical to having a great real estate investing experience. So Rick, you're my mentor on real estate, on fitness, and I'm not sure which one of you is who's mentor in fishing, but <laughs> <laughs> with a high demand and low supply, is now a good time to be a real estate investor? What's the market like for investors right now, Rick? Well, really, you know, Christina, it's, it's the question, how's the market? Exactly. And the, the irony is that the exact market that causes people to ask that question, because it's overheated. What do I mean by it's overheated? There's not enough buyers and there's a, uh, there's not enough sellers and there's a, um, a whole lot of buyers in the market and it's out of balance. And so we see multiple offers. We see prices extend beyond the list price. That is the exact market you want to invest in. Mm -hmm. You don't want a market when there's lots of homes for sale and you're an investor and you're going to go in and buy and, and you don't have any competition. There's nobody else bidding on that home. 
because when you buy that property, it's now declining in value because the demand is not keeping up with the supply and now you see prices drop. You want to buy in a hot market. You wanna buy and invest in real estate when, that when you're done and you move into it, and if you're gonna flip it, you show up with your paintbrush and you show up to make repairs to the property, that that time period, the property is going to be worth more when you put the for sale sign in. And if you're going to hold it even better because you're going to have the market trajectory and you want to buy in a hot market, it makes the purchasing process a little more challenging. It makes finding a home a little more challenging. All that's true, but you want to invest in a market that's strong and healthy. You don't want to purchase in a market where there's a plethora of homes to choose from nobody's buying and you're the only buyer out there because that home's going to be worth less a year later than what it was when you purchased it. That's good information. It is. So Damon, what do you look for when you are looking for a property to flip? Can you describe the perfect property? What is that pearl in the oyster that you're looking for? <laughs> well, it's sort of simple. I kind of look for cost, the cost of property, the, um, the rehab costs, and the ARV, that's kind of, if those numbers fall into place where they're supposed to fall into place, that's the, um, the perfect um, property for me. And that's just the rule of thumb mm -hmm. in my business. And how did you build your team of, I'm sure you have like contractors and painters. How did you find the right people to partner with? Like Rick was mentioning earlier. You know, that's a um, good question. You go through a lot of contractors I mean, a lot of contractors. <laughs> so I've gone through many, many contractors. You get the right one. It might have taken me two, three years to get the right, the right contractor, mm -hmm. especially to keep them, keep them busy enough to stay with you. You have mm -hmm. to stay busy every single month. Or should I, it's got to be their, their job all year long mm -hmm. just to keep that contract. Because if you, if you don't have any work from them, they're going somewhere else, you might lose them. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do. That's, okay. that's, how, that's, that's how it is with, with the contractors. You know, Christine, I've got a comment on that too. <laughs> your, your vendors, when we, we have them, we call them Rick's Picks. Uh, we, I think we have nearly 200 of them now that we've uh, identified that can help us. And we've got a directory that anyone can access on our website. Um, but it's so important because you need your costs to be consistent. You know, when, when Damon mentioned the ARV, the after repaired value of the property, um, you need to know how much it's going to cost to repair it. Right. And if those costs are inconsistent and they show up and now you find out that, you know, the, the painting or the repairs that you're going to do or the kitchen update or the bathroom updates or the redwood deck that needs to be installed is now twice the cost of what was estimated, you've got a problem because you're, you're holding the deed on that property in many cases. And so getting a trusted team that you can help, that, that can help you identify what the issues are so there are no surprises, help you identify what the costs associated are with that so that when you find that property, you're confident that your numbers are accurate. One of my mentors, we were talking about mentors earlier, used to tell me, Rick, uh, if you do the numbers, the numbers will tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. And that's what Damon's that's right. talking about. Do the numbers and the numbers will tell you what to do. Well, to do that, you got to have accurate numbers. Don't guess at it. You know, don't make it even an educated guess. Get a team of people that can walk through that property that you trust, have the eyes to recognize the problems associated with it. And that could be the problems associated for a contractor. It could be problems associated with the lender. It could be problems associated with purchasing title. It could be problems associated with remarketing the property. You got to identify those so that you can come up with solutions and do the numbers and the numbers will tell you what to do. So Rick, you have a team of 50 plus members. How important is it for an investor to have a good relationship with a realtor and what benefits does your team offer an investor? Well, I think it's, uh, and Damon can add some comments on this as well. And, you know, we share texts back and forth on opportunities that are coming to the market or may not even make the market. You know, for a lot of people, and I would even venture to say for the most people, for most people, they're going to want to put their home on the market. They're going to want to do the paint and the carpet and the landscaping themselves. They're going to want to do the cleaning and even maybe the staging and preparing the home because it's generally where they're going to get 
the highest possible sales price. And that, that's true for the vast majority of people, but it's not true for everyone. Uh, there are some people that they do not want to go through the effort of making those repairs. They don't have the financial resources to bring the, mar the property up to market standards. For some people, it's very emotional if they've lost a loved one or if there's a divorce involved. Probate transaction is an example. Uh, for others, it's more of a business um, more of a business deal than it is selling their home. You think about those that are selling at the courthouse steps that are in an auction, mm -hmm. or those that are selling with a company like Hudson Mar Hudson and Marshall or REDC, and they're doing massive sales of foreclosure properties or even a short sale. For others, it's more of a probate, and they've been assigned as the uh, the uh, the probate administrator, or it's a guardianship, and they're a conservatorship, and they're looking at uh, uh, this is not our wheelhouse to make these repairs and to prepare the home as a retail property for the market. And so there are these unique opportunities that exist uh, where a Damon can come in and make an offer, and it's not going to be at the this, the retail price. But for the right person, that's of great benefit. They'll accept the offer. Damon's going to make the repairs, or he's going to find another buyer. He's going to make a reasonable profit on the transaction, and it's a win-win for everybody involved. But it's got to be that right person. And identifying who that is, I gave you a litany of those op options that could be uh, available, can really help people um, liquidate a property without going through the traditional costs associated with making the repairs and getting it up to speed. Mm -hmm. So Damon, if someone wanted to become a real estate investor, what advice would you share with them? How do you get started? Well, you know, I would tell them education, education, because mm -hmm. that's really, really important. Because without knowledge, you can't really do this business. As Rick was saying, it's basically it's so many moving parts here. When you're first starting out, Every if you're just, if, it, if you're still testing on every flip that you do, you, you're still, you're, you're going you're gonna to have a lot of error there. So basically you want, you know, you want to know exactly what you're doing when you start this business, because it's like, it's like when you first pick up a book, you don't know what it is until you read it, basically mm -hmm. follow. But mm -hmm. real estate is really, to me, it's really intricate. It's a lot of moving parts with real estate. Every, everything counts. So you really have to know what you're doing. You can't just jump into real estate. It takes a little time. You do have to have a teacher. Mm -hmm. That's my thoughts on it. You know, Christina, and Damon's absolutely right. Uh, it's very expensive to learn by trial by error with real estate investing. You know, you buy a car and it doesn't work out. And you try flipping the car. That's okay. Uh, but you buy a house and you buy a house in the Bay Area, which may be north of a half a million dollars, and you bought it wrong. You, you, you improve it wrong. You sell it wrong, you lose money. So having the right education is important. Uh, one of those distant mentors that I had said it this way. Uh, somebody had called into their radio show, uh, the Real Estate Investment Radio Show, it was a podcast, and asked this simple question. They said, if I had $5,000 to invest in real estate, uh, where would you recommend that I invest it? And this was the podcast where there was the son, the father, and the grandfather, and they passed it on to grandpa and said, grandpa, what would you, how would you answer that? And he said, if I had $5,000 to invest in real estate, I'll tell you exactly where I would invest it. I would invest it in my education. Hmm. And to me, that spoke volumes. These are people that invest in real estate all over the world. Uh, not just in the, in the United States, invest in real estate all over the world in various types of properties. And they recognize the value of investing in your education, which is what Damon said. It's the very first place to put money. Today, you can do that in a variety of ways. And it doesn't have to be a significant investment. It certainly doesn't have to be $5,000. It can be much less with some of the Facebook groups or podcasts that are available, some of the books that are available to help you and guide you along the way, or some of those mentors that are out there in the market that are actually doing it. And that's why I had Damon here. So it's not theory, it's not an idea, it's not a suggestion, it's not, let me tell you what you ought to do. It's, it's more of, hey, let me just open up a window into my life about what I'm actually doing 
and help people do the same. And you know, the, <clears throat> excuse me, and with the internet, the internet makes it so easy to find all the tools you need to learn this business. It's there all day long and it's free to a certain extent. <laughs> what are some of your favorite <laughs> websites then, Damon? Where do you like to find your information? Um, <laughs> I put you on the spot, huh? <laughs> you put me on the spot, but I know, I know, I know a little bit already. But I know I'm gonna go to Bigger Pockets. I'll go to YouTube, and I follow um, what's that guy's name? I, I follow the Carrot Group, and I follow this other guy, Max Maxwell. So I, I follow certain certain people. Mm -hmm. So those kind of where I go, and they, and they're all good. These are all really good um, sources, especially Bigger Pockets. I think. They have a lot of good questions and answers there. And Max Maxwell has a story that he tells. It's, it's a really great story. And Carrot, they have a lot of um, real estate moguls on, on their site all the time. They have a lot of podcasts that I watch. And plus, I have their website. So, But that's what I do. Those are my sources I go to. And plus, I search through YouTube. And I have books that I read. But I don't, really read, I don't need to read too many books because I do know it because I'm, I'm active every day. So... So what does it look like every day in your, a day in the life of Damon? What do you do? Like, um, you get up, do you like market first? How much time do you spend um, contacting your contractors, seeing where each home is? How many homes do you have um, in the process at any given time? What does a day-to-day -day look like to you? Well, today, it's um, 2.21. I um, went up to the property this morning. Okay. I um, talk with my VA. She's doing her job. And basically, the day for me is, is on the phone. I've had probably 10 phone calls today. And so I, I'm, I spend a lot of time on the phone. And I talk to my other partner and see what, see what he's working on. I present um, whatever deals come across. I present them over to him so he can evaluate them if I'm not evaluating them. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of most most of my day is on the phone. I do a lot most a lot of phone work, lots of it, and I go look at properties all day. That's what I do. And my partner he handles the other part of it. He handles the construction side of it. Mm. Do you so rec my, recommend somebody have a partner in this type of business? You have to have a partner. You should have a project manager. I'm mm -hmm. sure Rick has a couple of project managers, right, Rick? Well, you we have, have a lot. We have we have about fifty team members, and right. They any of them share in the responsibility of either finding or improving or certainly the responsibility of finding a new buyer or, you know, to sell the property. And so uh, right. they tend to act in the nature of a, a project manager. Um, I, think a, I think a good real estate investor, their very nature is their project manager. They're a checklist. Right. When, you, when you hear a great investor uh, it's not like they show up and they just, they, they, they got, they don't just show up and walk through the property and smile. They've got their checklist. They walk through the property. They know what they're looking for. They're identifying areas of risk uh, that are associated with it. They know the market, what a property would sell for, or if they're, remember, we're talking today about flip, but there's another option that Christina, you and I talk about a lot, which is how to hold a property, how to make it a rental property. Uh, commercial, residential, we even talk about vacation rental properties and Airbnb, some of our past podcasts, we talk about how to do that. Mm -hmm. But you really have to, to, to think that through so that you make sure that your numbers are accurate and that you understand the condition of the property that you're buying and what your intentions are. What does that look like? And time uh, is often not on an investor side. If you think about it, you buy a property and you close escrow, uh, now you're the owner and who's responsible for the utilities? Who's responsible to maintain right. the pool or the landscaping? How about the property taxes? What about the, in, the insurance associated? So the moment you close, you become responsible for those things. So you don't want to figure it out as you go. You want to have trusted people that can say, these are the five things. These are the 10 things you need to do to the property. These are the areas that are of high priority, kitchens, bathrooms, uh, curb appeal, the health and safety <clears throat> concerns. And these are the areas of low priority. I see investors all the time and they're doing things that are so low of priority, they don't make sense. They're out there replacing a fence. They're out replacing a water heater because it's that age or a roof and it doesn't need to be done. 
And what, what we find is that those things have a very poor return of, of, on their investment to the point where you don't even get your investment back. And so you know where to invest your energy. Flooring is an exceptional place to invest time and energy and resources. Paint, exceptional place. Front yard landscaping, I have found time and time again, is one of my highest priorities. So, you know, a great investor they know the market, they know the home, they know what they're going to do, and they know the, uh, the buyer that's going to, to like that home. And they're going to try to capture a large buyer pool. Uh, they're not just looking for one buyer in the market. I often hear somebody say, I just need one. No, you probably need about 500 because right. 500 of them are going to click on it. And maybe 30 are going to schedule an appointment and 20 are going to show up mm -hmm. and, and five of them are going to love the property and three are going to write an offer and one you're going to accept and close. Mm -hmm. So we do need about 500. And so we can't have, wow. you know, we can't have tie dye carpet. We can't have the old green shag carpet anymore or the olive green dishwasher because that shrinks the buyer pool available also shrinks the tenant pool. We need multiple tenants that are interested if you're going to use the buy hold strategy. So we definitely need to make sure that there's a pool of buyers or tenants, depending on your strategy, that are available. So when you present that property to market, I always like to say it this way, nine out of 10 buyers want that home hmm. by based on how you've prepared it. 10 people walk right. through the home, nine of them want it. And things that are extreme, paint colors, flooring design, uh, outdated uh, kitchen, outdated bathrooms, things we would call uh, encumbrances or even obsolescence, weird stuff attached to a property uh, that just doesn't make sense, a terrible floor plan, odd curb appeal. You can fix some of those things. Uh, you can get a really good price on the property, fix it, and then tap into that large buyer pool which will generate you a great after repaired value that Damon was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. wow. Damon, I'd love to hear some of your tips too. Those are great tips, Rick. And Damon, I'm sure you have more to add. Well, I have a little bit to add. Rick pretty much um, said in a nutshell, but touching on what he said, you know, situations come up when you're, when you're trying to find a pro when you're buying a property and so certain cloud to say clients they want you to, when you're buying their properties they think they like the different colors they have all these different colors in their house they have this old kitchen old bathroom but sometimes they insist that their property is just as just as valuable as the property next door that just sold for 500 and they want 500 for, for theirs because you know, <laughs> a lot of a lot of sellers out there don't understand the values of their property and you can kind of show them the difference you can show them what the um what the house sold for next door and how it look pristine condition. Cause you know, when you, when you flip a property, you want that property to look brand new model material mm -hmm. and it can't look less than that. Or if you're not mm -hmm. like Rick said, if you want nine out of 10, nine out of 10 um, buyers to want mm -hmm. that property, it has to be in pristine condition. It can't just, you can't just leave anything out ever in a, in a property. That's my, my thoughts on it. Mm -hmm. The same thing yeah. Rick, Rick just said. Do you have some favorite materials to use for the kitchen, like granite countertops or laminate floors? What's your go-to? Um, we use a lot of, um, we use granite. We use the coarse, the coarse countertops. We use, um, what is it? I think travestine floors or something. Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar on the names of all the material that we use on, on the property, but we use some really great material. We don't use just any cheap material. It's always pretty pristine material that we use. Mm -hmm. I'm not a lot too, of it. Go ahead. Go ahead, David. No, I'm not too savvy on the construction part of it. I understand it, but I don't, that's for my contractor, for my partner. Okay. A lot of it depends on where the property is and the price point. Because the more money you invest into a property, uh, the higher you have to, to ratchet up the sales price of the home. And if you're in a market that it's not conducive, to doing all of those repairs. Let's talk about the kitchen, for example. Okay. The kitchen can really, what I call bleed. You wanna do the, you wanna do the countertops, you can do the countertops, but if you do the countertops, you're probably do the cabinets. You do the cabinets, right. you might as well do the appliances. And why not, since we're doing that, put in a new sink and a new faucet, yeah. new light <laughs> fixtures and on and on and on. And you just started off with 
countertops. You did the same thing right. with, bathroom, with the vanity and now the toilet, now the mirrors, now the fixtures. You know, now what about new tile? And these are how things uh, get out of alignment. This is how mm -hmm. prices and costs get out of control. And then it causes you to have to either raise the price and try to get a higher sales price for the home, which tends to take a little longer, or eat into your margin. Both are problematic. So you have to identify where that property is and what kind of market that you're in and which ones merit those kinds of repairs. Conversely, if you buy a property in, and we have offices throughout the San Francisco Bay Area and the Sacramento region, if it's in one of those higher San Francisco Bay Area neighborhoods and communities, entry level might be travertine. Entry level might be marble. In order to bring it up to the standard, I might be required to put in marble or travertine or something similar in that design. I may not be able to get away with carpet. I might have to do a hardwood flooring. I might have to do a, a, a higher quality Italian tile as a necessity in order to bring it up to the standard that the market bears for that property. And so when you look at a particular home, it's difficult to say, this is the type of material I use every single time, because depending on the neighborhood, depending on the community, depending on the price point, all of that tends to change. And if you overinvest in a neighborhood, it's a huge problem for a lot of investors. They come in, they let that bleed happen. I was just going to do the cabinets. I was just going to do the countertops. I was just going to do the appliance. And now I've got so much invested into it. I can't sell the property for what I have invested in. Big mistake for investors to make those decisions on the fly while they own the home, while they're paying the utility and property taxes on a monthly basis. It would be far better for them to have a clear strategy. This is what I'm going to do for this particular property in this community at this price point that's going to attract this particular buyer this group of this buyer pool that's available, so much better to have that clear strategy outlined before you ever even write an offer on the property. And that goes back to what Damon was talking about, doing the walkthrough, clearly having that strategy, that plan, uh, instead of trying to make those decisions while you're in the middle of it. And you know, it also goes back to what you said, um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, every property, every deal is not a good deal. And mm -hmm. that's that's where that come into, come into play. If you account for that when you're negotiating, you normally may not have that problem when it's time to sell. But mm -hmm. then it's far and few properties. You don't get as many as you would like, but you'll get a few, but you still make your number. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, it's a great point. And when we actually look at the market, uh, what we find is there's a lot more hold opportunities than even flip. So there's, there's a small fraction of the market that's good for specific investors, rental. There's markets that are not good or homes that are not a good fit for a rental property. You bought a 5,000 square foot home. It's got dual air conditioners. <laughs> it's got 4,000 square feet of carpet. Probably the numbers don't line up to make that a traditional single family, one tenant rental property. It just doesn't make sense. And the same is also true with investors. So there's a bigger pool for investment property that's a hold, and there's a smaller pool, even smaller for the, for the flip market. Those don't come up every day. That's why he has the VAs, the virtual assistants that are out there looking for them, and, and in some sense kind of going through and trying to find those right opportunities because there's even less of those flip opportunities available than even the hold and even the investment market isn't the entire market. It, real estate is generally a good investment. I've said this for years, not only real estate is hazardous to your wealth. I believe that. I believe it's not just a good investment for the sake of ROI, but for your kids' college education, for your retirement, for cash flow in the future. I can't think of anything that produces better income than rental income. It's good for taxation. You have IRS code 121. You can live in a home for two of the past five years and sell it. You don't want to do that. We do a 1031 exchange and exchange the property for another and keep exchanging them. There's a lot of things you can do with real estate that makes it a great investment. But if we're purely looking for the, the buy and hold and the buy and flip, it's a smaller segment of the market. You got to know what you're looking for, what you're going to do, and who that end user is going to be. You identify those things and you can really have a rewarding career as a real estate investor. Yeah, that's smart. Um, and Damon, 
Rick knows that I'm an HGTV junkie. I watch Flip or Flop. I watch Flipping 101. <laughs> I watch Flipping Sisters. I mean, flipping is hot right now, but it's ultra it glamorized too. You know, you go in, no problems, half an hour, your house is done. So what is the most common misconception that people have about flipping? And what do you wish people knew about real estate investing? Well, you know how the TV shows are. <laughs> it's not perfect it's, what it's not well you know it is perfect on tv yeah but it's just it's just not what you see on tv it's so much more to it it's so much more um intricate and the misconception is that people think they can just jump in and they can just jump in and do what what the guys are doing on television and they can't really do that just for the, for what they've done on television those properties you may have seen it took them a lot of work to get that one property. Mm -hmm. If in fact it is one of their properties that they actually got, who knows? It could have been staged. I don't know. <laughs> 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 so that's, that's a misconception there. It, it takes a um, lot, again, back to market, it takes lots of marketing to get these properties so that you can actually get a property. You know, it's not easy. It's not, it's not something you can just, it's not a walk in the park. I'll just put it that way. Mm -hmm. You have to understand, you have to be educated and you have to know what you're doing. So when you watch TV, it's just not something you want to do. Mm -hmm. Pick up a book. <laughs> <laughs> He's absolutely right. There are a lot of challenges and it does require an education and, and you should grow and you should uh, pursue that. And it's also very rewarding. <laughs> it is extremely rewarding, uh, both for those that own in real estate, um, because if you own an investment property, uh, say a rental property, for example, when the rental market increases, you benefit. And when the home value rises, you benefit. And if the home value were to drop and the rental market stays strong, you still benefit. If the rental market drops and your home value rises, you still benefit. And generally speaking, those two things have been rising for many, many years, uh, even in some markets over a decade. And a lot of people, you know, what we teach them, Christina, is own the home free and clear. Mm -hmm. Like don't have a mortgage on it. Now, you might start off with a mortgage, but own it free and clear. 100% of the homes that are foreclosed upon had a mortgage. Own the home free and clear. Own it where you don't have a mortgage on it because then that rental income could be used to fund your kid's college education. That rental income, I mean, think about college today and the price, how costly college is. Uh, you've got a couple of beautiful young ladies in your home and think about in the future, you're going to have to pay for college. And how are you going to do that in 15 years from now, having a home that's paid off free and clear and you own that home and the rental income isn't going to Bank of the West or Bank of America or Wells Fargo, it's going to your household. And that's a great way to help supplement the income that's necessary to divert over to college. Or think about retirement. At some point, you're going to retire. How do you create income at retirement? And it's not by, you know, a lot of people talk about uh, other people's money and how we're going to use that. What you really want to do is you really want to own that thing free and clear. Because if you can own the property free and clear, you can create an income at retirement uh, that doesn't touch the value of the property. It doesn't even impact the equity. You're renting it, and every month you're getting a rental check that's funding your retirement. And so it, there are a lot of challenges, and we talk about some of those things, and it's also very rewarding, which makes a career in real estate or a career as a real estate investor uh, that much more rewarding. It's also, I think, very rewarding, and Damon, I'm sure you've experienced this as well, when you find a home, and it's the one in the neighborhood that everybody, nobody wants to look at. Uh, it's a disaster on the outside. It's a disaster on the inside. I remember one property that we worked with on one of our investors. We've had the privilege now of working with over 1,200 people on investing in real estate. And one investor, there were multiple rats dead in the house. Oh, no. Wow. And I would try to get there before so I could remove the rats so that they wouldn't freak out. I told them about it. They knew about it, but they bought this house and there were multiple rats in the house. And they bought it and they fixed it up and they flipped it. And this particular investor, um, this became their strategy. They would come in, they would buy a property, they would fix it up. And it was always the home on the street that was the eyesore. 
It was always the diamond in the rough. And so when he finished that home, it was the nicest house on the street. Mm -hmm. And so there's a value to what we do that's, I don't know, more intrinsic in nature. It's not, there's an economic value. Uh, there's a value for your future economically, but there's also a value for what we do in communities. We take that home that's the eyesore in the community, the one that's just falling apart, and we make it one of the nicest properties in the community, and we sell that property to somebody that they absolutely love getting a property that those improvements have been made and would never buy a property in its former state uh, without us making those repairs. And so that's some of the intrinsic value I find living in a city, buying and investing in real estate in that city or some of the adjacent cities. I'm actually improving the homeowners. I'm actually improving my neighbor, the neighbors of my pro right. of the properties. Their values have gone up because <laughs> we've improved the quality of that home. And based on the resources and the skill sets that we have and the knowledge of the real estate market, uh, together, everyone achieves more. That's what happens when we invest in real estate with our real estate teams. You know, um, back to the TV show, you know, you, there is a TV show that, that doesn't have a misconception. And as you're talking about the properties that's kind of run down the neighborhood, but you see these, you see the show, the hoarding show. Mm -hmm. I have actually, we have actually bought properties that look just like that mm -hmm. TV show. And I've been in some really very nice areas where it's just ugly and it's really piled up to the ceiling like that before you can't walk in a place. So I guess the TV show is true when it comes to the hoarding. <laughs> <laughs> so according to Rick, the number of rats is, is in direct proportion to the uh, profit you make. Is that true? That's exactly right. It's a five rat deal. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and Excellent. I can't stand rats. <laughs> I'm really scared of them. Most of the flip properties that I've worked with, Christina, there, there's always been something. Uh, and, and I don't know how to describe it. There's always been something that um, either the seller didn't want to put in the amount of money that was needed to make the repair. It was located in an area that, uh, you know, that was impacted. It was a foreclosure. It was a short sale. Uh, it was a property that um, the administrators didn't want to put into the probate or the successor trustees didn't want in. But like, there's always something. And for some, it's mice or rats or cobwebs or trash or debris or hoarding, as Damon had mentioned. There's something that tends to exist that people don't want to deal with. Uh, maybe right. they just don't want to deal with the management. Maybe they don't want to deal with people walking through their homes home and showing properties on the market. They don't want to deal with the first sale sign and the neighbors. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and many times their values have risen to such a level that they can sell the property even to an investor. And they did really, really well compared to what they purchased it at. And so for the right person, the real estate investor, it's not for everybody. Uh, it's not even for most people, but for the right person, the real estate investor can be a great option to sell your property to. You know, um, when you say that, different different circumstances of people, I had a um, a girl walk up to me. Well, actually, I was doing business with her, she, or she wanted to buy another house somewhere else. But she just came up to me and said, you can have my house. I'm done with it. I don't want it anymore. I'm going to sign it over to you. And we bought the house just like that. Just gave it to me. Wow. But then she then she went and bought another house. Nice. <laughs> she, she was just, I mean, that doesn't, that, that doesn't come. That might be once in a lifetime deal there, but that's awesome. It, it did happen. <laughs> it happened. It was, this was years ago. It happened though. <laughs> awesome. So. so Rick, what should investors be doing today to reap the benefits down the road? How do they get started? Uh, first thing they should do, Christina, subscribe to our podcast, because if you like this conversation and you've made it this far in our podcast and you've learned something, um, then explore other podcasts because we talk not just about flipping like we're talking with Damon about or wholesaling, but we talk about how to own a vacation rental. We talk about how to how to uh, find and, and market an Airbnb or a VRBO, a home away type property. Uh, we also talk about commercial and how to own commercial properties and how so many people ought to be owner users. You know, I think about uh, some of these uh, business people in the community and they're 
they own their house, but they're renting their commercial building. Um, and they should buy that building and become an owner user because they're often really good tenants for themselves. Uh, we talk about buy and hold and what that looks like and how to buy and hold property and why find a tenant and what that looks like and how to avoid you know, tenants that are gonna call you late at night when the toilets uh, backing up. We can talk about how to avoid that and the strategy of using home warranty companies or having vendors uh, on the ground that can serve those, those communities. So if you're interested, join, like subscribe to our podcast or visit our YouTube channel. Uh, you can do all that at connectwithrickfuller.com. If you want to know where the market's going, which is where we started the conversation, then go to ricksmarketupdate.com. Uh, Christina, you and I have shot several videos. We've also done some other videos that are all about the state of the market. We go a deep dive into where the market's, where the market is and where it's going. And our Investors Thrive Facebook group, like that would be the third place I would say get plugged in and that's free. You got a bunch of investors on there that they get a document that they like to use on their initial checklist. We upload it. Uh, we're constantly uploading videos and ideas and strategies. And it's just a, it's a learning center. Um, I'll go back to what one of the mentors that I had shared with me. If I had $5,000 to invest in real estate, I would spend that $5,000 on my education. Here's a great opportunity to learn how it's really done. Not what's on TV, not what's on the late night infomercial, not what's on the radio, or what's what's coming through your, your Facebook feed as a sponsored ad. This is what people are really doing, boots on the ground right here in the community, in the Bay Area in Sacramento County. So if you're interested in that, get on one of those free resources. They're great, they're free, and you hear a lot more about what we talked about today. Rick, you said that very well. I'm going to sign up right now. <laughs> <laughs> you sold me on that one. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> wow. But there's no, there's no money there. It's all free resources. Right. They're all, tools, they're all available. <laughs> um, and it's a community that we're building. And Christina, you know, you and I talked about why we built this. We built this because people came to us with ideas that were not rooted in reality. And we said, let's just show people what it's really like to invest in real estate and do it well and not be overly leveraged, not get into crazy deals, not do things you don't understand, but let's just open up uh, a window of opportunity for them to learn of what people are really doing. I, I mentioned earlier, we've had the, pro Zillow has said that we've sold over 1200 homes. We've learned a lot about real estate investing. Um, and so we want to share what we've learned and that's the motivation behind this is to be real, to be transparent, to be genuine, uh, share what we're doing, share what others are doing so that people can actually see how to invest in real estate. They don't get sucked into spending, you know, all this money on books and CDs and resources. And at the end of the day, all they have is a theory that works in Mississippi or in South Dakota, but it doesn't work in California. So many of the things that they teach, including things about double escrows and things about, about uh, uh, assignments, they're just not a reality in the Bay Area. Uh, they're not a reality in Sacramento. It, it just isn't happening. There's things that prevent them from happening. And that's what a lot of these late night infomercials are teaching. So what we do is we just kind of open up the books and say, here's what we're helping people do. Here's what we're doing ourselves. And if you can glean some insights from it, we're glad to share that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Okay. Thank you, Rick and Damon, for giving us an insider and expert view on this important subject. <sighs> to learn more about real estate investing, like Rick said, join our Facebook and Facebook group, Investors Thrive. To con <sighs> connect with Damon, please visit his <sighs> website, letsmakeahousedeal.com. And I'll also put that in our uh, comment section. Join us next week when we talk about market versus appraised value. Thank you, everyone, for spending part of your day with us. Be sure to put a great review for our podcast on whatever platform you're streaming from and have a great day. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thanks.